Uh, I've been flying the U-2 for just over uh, three and a half years. I was a uh, B-52 pilot. I'm uh, just finishing up my seventh deployment in the U-2. Nothing is quite like the U-2. Everyone has to do some sort of transition when they come to fly it. The B-52 was similar in some respects, has a long wingspan. So keeping the wings level on landing is something I was comfortable with. The big difference was the B-52 lands in a crab, whereas the U-2, uh, you can't land in a crab or it, things will go uh, wrong very quickly. So uh, taking a crab on landing was a new sensation. It took some getting used to. The, uh, the crew aspect is, uh, is different too. I flew on a five-person crew in the B-52, you're all alone in the U-2, but that's something that I wanted to try. I hadn't flown a uh, single-seat aircraft before, and that's one of the challenges of the U-2. Uh, before every uh, high fight in the U-2, we need to pre-breathe 100% oxygen for an hour prior to takeoff. Uh, we have a, uh, a squadron back of uh, PSD we call them, uh, Physiological Support Division, whose sole job is to take care of uh, U-2 pilots for uh, high and low flights. Uh, they maintain the, uh, the full pressure suit, they integrate uh, us into the suit and then uh, into the jet. Uh, it's a lengthy process because of the, uh, the nature of the suit, we can't uh, reach behind us or over our shoulders. So uh, once we get into the jet, they have to uh, hook up every latch buckle and uh, we're totally helpless to their expertise to uh, ensure that we're integrated properly and that all our survival equipment is, uh, is ready for, uh, for launch. The U-2 has been serviced uh, over 50 years now in uh, various different forms. Uh, this is the U-2S model, Block 20 we call it. Uh, has upgraded engine, uh, upgraded avionics, the, uh, the premier high-altitude intelligence surveillance reconnaissance uh, aircraft in the uh, Air Force inventory. Uh, the U-2 uh, employs uh, multiple different uh, sensors, both imagery and uh, signals intelligence sensors, which brings a unique capability uh, to the combatant commander. So the jet behind me has both uh, a radar imagery a sensor in the nose and also a signals intelligence and a communications intelligence uh, sensors uh, throughout the aircraft. The U-2 is uh, regarded as uh, the most difficult uh, aircraft in the Air Force to land. Taking off in the aircraft is also a pretty uh, task intensive. Once you get into the high altitude regime, uh, however, it moves more into an employment phase. You're not as uh, task saturated with flying the aircraft. We do have an autopilot, which uh, takes care of a lot of the, uh, the tests for the pilot. It's mostly uh, mission monitoring and uh, working the sensors with our uh, ground component. Because we have the, uh, the pogos under the wings, which keeps the wingtips off the ground, uh, we have to maintain wings level on takeoff so the pogos drop together. Landing the aircraft is uh, very challenging, uh, especially when there's turbulence or excessive crosswinds. Because of the, uh, the unique nature of the landing gear, it has a bicycle landing gear. We cannot tolerate uh, excessive crosswinds on landing. We have to uh, manually uh, take all the crab and drift uh, out uh, before uh, touching down. We need to uh, land on the tail wheel because it's basically a powered glider. The aircraft doesn't fly onto the runway like a traditional aircraft. Uh, we need to uh, stall the aircraft to get it to uh, come down out of the air. We don't want to do that too high off the ground, however, you'll damage uh, the aircraft and equipment. So that's why we have a mobile officer who chases the aircraft on landing, uh, talks the pilot down, uh, letting him know his altitude and attitude, uh, and letting him basically know when it's safe to let the aircraft stall and uh, hit the deck. For landing, one of the challenges is uh, you've been uh, airborne for a long period of time uh, wearing the full pressure suit. Each pilot does what he can to psych himself up for the landing because it's the most challenging part and uh, probably the most dangerous part of the, of the mission. You have a general fatigue after flying for about 10 hours, uh, breathing 100% oxygen. There's really no way to, uh, to keep your energy stayed up uh, the whole uh, sortie. Uh, as it was taught to me, the, the moment you uh, pull the, put the helmet on and uh, close the face shield, uh, that's as much energy as you're going to have all day. And uh, you fight for the rest of the day just to maintain uh, what you can. On the way down the descent, uh, you probably haven't hand flown the aircraft in a while, so you get the feel for it on the way down. You're talking to uh, air traffic control and you're talking to your mobile. And then once you're on short final, you spot your mobile out there. Once you're over the airfield, you can get a sense of the winds and what you need to do to put the, put the jet on the ground at that point. You do have a weight on your neck and shoulders. A lot of people have back problems and neck problems from the helmet. They put a, a lumbar support on the ejection seat uh, to help uh, relieve that, but there's not a lot of room. It's a pretty cramped cockpit. After a two-month deployment, uh, neck and back problems are pretty common. The suit's designed uh, to be worn sitting down, so standing and walking is uh, kind of awkward. Uh, after a sortie, jumping out and walking back in the building, it feels good to stretch your legs. Uh, the cockpit is a little cramped. Uh, with the full pressure suit, uh, you need to have everything in front of you. It's very difficult to turn around. You can't see behind you very well, and it's also very difficult to reach in behind you. 
Uh, you have your food and uh, waters uh, behind you, but everything you need to fly the aircraft is, is directly in front. Uh, your feet are attached to the aircraft. Uh, we, have, we wear metal spurs uh, attached to cables uh, that uh, retract in the event of an ejection. Everyone has a routine to kind of get them through the 10 hour flight. Some people uh, drink and eat at certain uh, periods. Uh, some people bring uh, reading materials or music, or they uh, can talk over the link to their, uh, to their mock or GMS, who are our ground controllers back in the States. Once at altitude, uh, we uh, monitor the aircraft. It's a very narrow margin that we fly in at such a high altitude. Uh, we monitor the, uh, the sensors in the jet and uh, we speak to our ground controllers, the, uh, the Mach and GMS, and uh, also to forces on the ground uh, to um, come up with uh, additional taskings that uh, we may not have had uh, upon takeoff. Uh, especially in the sorties we're flying out here, there's a lot going on on the ground, so there's plenty of frequencies to listen to, plenty of people to talk to on the ground. For, for some of these sorties, it's the first time that you're not uh, on link, so there's no one to talk to. You're kind of by yourself, finally, alone in a single-seat aircraft. So just, uh, just flying the jet, getting the, the feel for it, checking out the weather, finding the airfield, all that kind of stuff just uh, gets you in the mindset for uh, getting ready to land. We call it tube food. It's uh, specially designed food that they uh, put in little pouches attached to straws, and the uh, straw fits into a, uh, a slot in the helmet, and uh, you just squeeze it in. Uh, they've got desserts, fruits, hot meals. There's a food heater in the aircraft. You can uh, you can heat up your food. I only eat the uh, vegetables and fruit, really. Uh, I've tried everything, but uh, I find heating up the food to be uh, a pain. Uh, so it's just easy to grab something that's good cold. It's a unique experience the first time you fly high in the U-2. Uh, they have you try everything. Try the food, you know, drink the water, uh, use the ur urination device. To just make sure that you understand how the suit works and you can do everything you need to do up at altitude. Because you only fly uh, in a two-seater U-2 for a couple sorties before you're flying solo high. And you want to make sure you've tried everything at least once before you go solo. Just this last deployment, uh, was, uh, I had finally flown across every uh, longitude on the Earth, which was, uh, which was a nice little goal I had set for myself. So I've, uh, I've gotten to see a lot of the planet from a really unique view. Uh, the Alps, K2, which you can see up in the northeast of Afghanistan. The northern lights over Greenland at 70,000 feet is something that you'll never forget. Now we carry multiple different uh, sensors. Most sorties uh, have both a imagery sensor and also uh, sensors for uh, communications intelligence, also signals intelligence. So it uh, makes for a, uh, a mix, uh, mixed mission, both strategic and tactical, especially in the, uh, the AOR that we're flying in today. Both because of our large footprint and uh, the, the different sensors that we carry on, uh, on all of our sorties, uh, we can be very helpful uh, with uh, troops in contact situations on the ground. The U-2 is a single uh, seat aircraft, but uh, we fly using the wingman concept. Uh, our mobile uh, is a U-2 pilot as well. He's the one who helps us take off and land, and he's there for, uh, for anything we might need. Uh, he's there to greet us on the ground, as well as uh, all the maintainers who did uh, such a, a good job of getting the aircraft uh, in the air and are ready to uh, turn the aircraft and, and send it on its way tomorrow. We call it the Brotherhood. It's kind of a, a cliche, but uh, it really fits the U2 community. It's a small, tight-knit community. We all wear our solar numbers on our name tags. It's kind of how we define ourselves. I'm solar number 836, so that I know that I was 836 pilot to solo the U2. Any person I see wearing a solar patch or has a solar number on their name tag, I know they're part of the Brotherhood. I know they, what they went through and they know what I went through. 